everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Thursday of the month, which means it's time for our resident plant-based dermatologist, Dr. Jessica Krant, to answer your questions. We get more questions for Dr. Krant than any other guests on Chef AJ Live, so we can't take them from the chat. You do need to send them to us in advance. Every weekend, we send you an email with the show lineup for that week and simply respond to that email. Always know if your question is anonymous, please put that in the first line of the heading because many times I've read the whole thing with the name and then it says, please ask this anonymously. So without further ado, Dr. Jessica Crand, how are you today? Hi, Chef AJ. Uh, always so excited to be here with you. I've been looking forward to our chat today and I'm excited. Well, you know, I was talking to you right before we uh, pressed the button to go live. And what I said is that uh, with Dr. Lyle, who also gets almost as many questions as you that we, that we need to do a marathon and we are doing something in July called the Dugathon. And I think if there's interest, we should probably do something like that with you because we just, we can't keep up with the questions. It's like that game whack-a-mole. We get through, you know, 40 or 50 and then a hundred come in. So apparently it's a very uh, imp important and uh, popular topic because as we mentioned, not everybody has a prostate, but everybody has skin and a lot of it. Like how much skin do we have if we were to like take, oh, this is terrible, like Hannibal, like, <laughs> if we were to take it off, how much skin do we have? Oh, you know, I bet you there's actually someone in the audience that knows the answer to that. And I don't know. And I guess it's fair because we're all different sizes. So I'll have to look into the average amount of skin, but yeah, we don't want to think too much about that. Okay, great. Well, the first question is from Barbara and she says, and I don't know if we've even talked about this much on the show, but her question is about baldness. And she said, can you talk a little bit about hair loss and baldness in a female? What causes it and what is the remedy? Hair loss is, you know, I think a lot of people by now have heard the word alopecia and sometimes it gets used as a bit of a nickname, but the word alopecia truly means hair loss. So there can be a lot of different types of alopecia and the type that affects men and women that is hormonal or, and, or age related is called androgenetic or androgenic. And what that means is that the the hormones responsible for maintaining healthy follicles and healthy growth, age appropriate, healthy growth start to change. And if it's in a woman, it's, you know, emotionally more impactful and dramatic because we're sort of culturally used to men potentially losing their hair. It's very genetic, but when, when it happens to women, it's, it's more upsetting in our culture. That's hormonal hair loss. There's also uh, a type of hair loss called telogen effluvium, which is very common, very common. And it's the type of hair loss we get after a, a severe illness, a hospitalization, a trauma, and actually after giving birth. Uh, I guess our bodies are, when our bodies are very distracted by a uh, immune issue, a health issue, a, a stressor, all of our energy goes this is sort of colloquial understanding. All of our energy goes to healing us and protecting us or maybe growing a baby. And we lose our, our bodies lose focus on using that energy to grow hair. So the hair follicles actually switch off and the hairs that are on your head start to fall out much quicker than normal because the hair has moved into the phase called telogen, which is the one of the three phases of hair growth in the phase of telogen, the hair falls out. The phase of anagen is when the hair is act actively growing. There's a healthy hair bulb and the hair is growing and getting longer. And the phase of catagen is when that hair bulb starts to dissolve, that follicle goes to sleep and that hair stops growing. So anagen, catagen, and telogen are a cycle that keeps going around forever when we quickly move all the hairs at the same time into telogen because of a stressor, it falls out called, it's called telogen effluvium. And I think it's probably a Latin root. Effluvium is a, a root that means something like rainfall or flood when there's a, a fluvial um, 
glow, that's like a flood or a rainfall. So it's like the hair all flooding out off our heads at the same time. So that's just two types of hair loss. Those are both considered non-scarring. The follicles are still there. They're just not working properly. Scarring hair loss is a different subcategory that can include um, traction alopecia, which is from tight hairstyles. It could be a chemical alopecia where the hair follicles are damaged from maybe years of chemical treatments. It could be an inflammatory or autoimmune condition um, that causes inflammation in the hair follicles that eventually kills and then scars the hair follicles. In these cases, when the follicle is invisible, completely gone and scarred over, the follicle cannot come back into that area. So hair loss in those cases is permanent in those areas. And we try to catch it early so we can halt the scarring process and save the follicles. So there's a tiny little overview of hair loss. Nice. I always hear that on the commercials, male pattern baldness, like they say that word pattern baldness. Right. So there's male pattern baldness, which happens in a classic pattern that you think of for men. There's also female pattern baldness, which is the classic pattern that happens to women as we get older. And male pattern baldness tends to start with a thinning at the temples and then in the vertex back here. The crown is the top, the direct top of the head and female pattern baldness tends to be thinning right at the top. And that's just classic for men, men versus women or male hormone versus female hormone pattern loss. Nice. Well, thanks. So this next question is from, who's it from? Uh, Luann, last month when you were on Chef AJ's show, you mentioned azeliac acid and bacuchiol. I'm trying to fade dark spots on my face and wondered which would be best to use. Can you tell me the difference between the two and indications for both? And if you have any favorite brands. So we get every month about brands. One day you're just going to have to come out. Maybe if we do the, uh, should we call it a Jessica-a-thon or a crant thon Maybe you could actually do an overview. And because I know you don't have any affiliation to products, so it would be an honest and biased review. Right. I was trying to decide whether we would call it Jessica-thon or Crantathon. We'll have to decide. <laughs> um, I, I think that Bacuchiol and Azelaic acid would might both be valuable for fading dark spots. It on as I always say, it really depends on what is causing the dark spots. But both of these products are beneficial. Both of these ingredients are beneficial and helpful. And neither one, if used properly, would hurt. From what I know in general, the bacuchiol acts like a retinoid, which is in the in the not from the plant derived sources, is a vitamin A derived molecule. Ret the retinoids include over the counter retinol, prescription tretinoin, tazeratine, um, adapalene. Those are all retinoids. They're in the same category as the pill. Accutane, which is a very strong prescription medicine used for acne that really helps people who need it. So all of these are vitamin A derivatives and Bacuchiol is the attempt to copy that from a plant source. They help to regulate the development of the keratinocytes, the main cells in our skin that we see, that we think that we think we're talking about when we talk about our skin. It helps them be juicier, younger, and a little bit increased rate of turnover. So we don't have so many older dried out skin cells on us. It also may do what the retinoids do, which is to stimulate a little bit of the collagen formation in the dermis, which is under the epidermis where the keratinocytes are. So Bacuchiol will help skin cell turnover, which will help to refresh and to remove older cells that are holding on to pigment molecules. It also helps to regulate how the cells, the, the melanocytes, which are the cells that form the pigment molecules, how those cells develop and grow. The azelaic acid, I must tell you right now, no one is exactly sure how it's working or why it's doing what it's doing yet. It's a little bit of a new kid on the block, but it's been so beneficial in so many ways and so easily tolerated and so safe 
that it's used for a lot of things. It does help to turn down pigment production by the melanocytes and it helps to re reduce transfer of the pigment granules to the keratinocyte. So it reduces pigment production. It helps to smooth texture. It helps to reduce inflammation and redness. And in generally, it also may help acne. So I can't say which would be better because I also am not looking at your skin. And I think it's worth trying both. Thank you. Here's a question from Karen, who is watching live, but she submitted it in advance, which is why we're asking it. She asks, outside of a facelift, can anything help with sagging jowls and marionette lines? There's no one answer for this. Uh, all of these devices and procedures probably help a little bit. Nothing will really take the place of surgery if there's a significant amount of sagging and looseness of the skin. We just don't have the technology to tighten the skin enough without the risk of damaging it. It's we the the amount of heat would be that would be required to tighten it that much is just very high risk for scarring, um, leaving the skin uneven and damaging the, the tissue. So I would say speak to your local dermatologist about what they may have to offer. It could be radio frequency. It could be ultrasound. It could be a form of microneedling, which has risks because it does poke the skin and can leave tiny scars. Uh, it could be a little bit of filler treatment in the right places because when we use filler to take up volume, it also does stimulate new collagen formation, which can over time help to maintain a little bit of tightness and a little bit of juiciness in the skin. Um, similar, say, the same way that uh, micro needling and, and PRP do. So it's, a, it's, I would say it's about a little bit of everything. There's no one answer for that. And it is a little bit of the Holy grail. If we could just keep that skin tight and not have to do surgery, I think whoever really gets that one right is going to be very popular. I know Karen lost a lot of weight. So could that be a reason that, that maybe she has this? Well, for sure. You know, as, as women, especially as women get older, um, even if we maintain the same weight, our faces lose baby fat and um, the thickness of the dermis and the juiciness of the collagen and our epidermal layer, that outer layer actually does thin also. So overall, even if we maintain the same weight as we get older, we tend to get thinner in the face and get a little bit of saggy skin. Um, if you, if you do actively lose weight, it's even more dramatic. So it's understandable to be looking into these procedures in that case with weight loss filler is fillers is really one of the best things to make sure that you're doing because we do need to replace the volume in the correct areas. And that has an effect if done properly of lifting, um, making, hopefully making sure that it's not overdone and looking too filled. It still should look natural. Right. Well, you know, you see these celebrities that are like in their 60s, 70s and 80s, they don't have a wrinkle. They don't have a line. I mean, they've had work, right? Some of them, it may be genetic, but you know, for people who have facials every single month or small procedures every month, and they can afford to just keep going and keep going and keep going. These micro injuries, these medically controlled micro injuries over time do stimulate constant sort of the skin thinks of it as being injured and healing. <clears throat> so if you can constantly stimulate that over time, you probably do gain some benefit. It's, it would be hard for people who don't have a celebrity budget to do the procedures over time, but things like the retinoids, you know, maybe facial massage, things that are, are small stimulations probably do have a benefit over a long period of time. Nice. People that seem to like Crantathon better than Jessica-athon. It's just a little harder to say Jessica-athon. 
Oh yeah. I was thinking we include that a like Jessica Thon, but Jessica Thon. Yeah. Jessica Thon. Crantathon is a little more, has a little more pizzazz. Yeah, I think so. I like it. So just, it just sounds, uh, it sounds fun. And people are asking where you practice and you do practice. You're a practicing MD and you're board certified, not only in dermatology, but lifestyle medicine. You can also work as a health coach and you are in Manhattan, I believe. That's right. I, I practice in a dermatology office in Manhattan. We don't have any telemedicine going right now. So you would have to come see me in the New York office, which would be my pleasure. And actually, Chef AJ, I have to tell you, even this week alone, I met many patients who found me through your show. So I'm really honored and flattered. Oh my God, this is like amazing. I love this. You know, I just love that I'm able to have this service and, and connect people like worldwide. I love it. Uh, Diane says, I first saw Dr. Crant on Chef AJ and I've been seeing her for the last nine months. Hi, Dr. Crant. I love this. And I take no commission, just so you know. <laughs> oh, that's, I mean, people do offer to pay to be on the show and I don't do that. So um, anyway, that's wonderful. This is from Mila. She says, can you please ask Dr. Krant about Botox injections for migraine treatments? How safe is it and how effective is it? Botox treatments for migraine. It is a real thing. It is legitimate. It is studied and researched, but I am not a neurologist. So I cannot really speak to the science of exactly what's happening. When I do Botox, I do cosmetic Botox only. And that's what I'm trained in. That's what I'm certified in. So I, I actually have personal friends who get Botox for migraines and it does, it, you know, I think that some of the theory is that the, some of the migraines are triggered by microscopic muscle actions, even around blood vessels. Every blood vessel has a little microscopically thin muscle wall, especially the arteries and the Botox put into the correct places in, in neurology and migraine treatment. It's all over the head. It's the back of the neck, it's the shoulders and sometimes into the jaw and chewing areas that may help to relax tension in general around the head which may prevent a cascade of triggers. Um, and I'm not sure if they try to claim that it actually affects the blood vessel walls directly, but I know that could help a lot of people. So it's legitimate. When you see a neurologist for it, it's probably poten potentially able to be covered by insurance. If you are proven to have chronic, severe migraines, you know, I know the FDA approval is for more than half of each month. So that's a very high barrier to overcome to officially have it FDA approved for your migraines. But if you speak to a neurologist who does the treatments, they'll be able to guide you in what they're able to get covered. I know that I have patients who get migraine treatment with Botox and they come to me still for the cosmetic Botox because the migraine treatment for Botox does not get put in the same places and it doesn't come out looking the same way. So they want to leave the cosmetic treatment to me and do the rest of the areas for migraine with their neurologist. You know, how do you feel about Botox in general? Because, you know, I, I, I never actually had it. Um, I, I mean, you know, people have accused me, but I, because I'm basically afraid, but Dr. Lyle has told me not to have it. He feels it's not safe. And I wasn't going to get it for cosmetic reasons, but it was recommended to me by a, what's the type of doctor? ENT doctor, because I have really bad TMJ. And mm -hmm. that's apparently a treatment for TMJ now. Instead, I went and did acupuncture because even though it's a needle, it's not, there's no toxins in, in acupuncture. How do I personally feel about Botox? Yeah. I, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. I, I believe, first of all, it has so many legitimate, serious medical, um, benefits. It helps migraine. It helps spa, uh, spasming bladders for people who have trouble with, with incontinence. It helps torticollis muscle spasms, and it helps people with cerebral palsy to be able to release muscles that otherwise won't release. It helps chronic pain. And there are so many new, it helps blepharospasm and it helps uh, eye, eye problems. So there are so many medical issues that it's really a, a boon for. Cosmetically, um, 
this is our culture. So I I'm supportive of people who want to feel refreshed and feel like themselves and feel awake and feel that they look as good as they can. But I am a little concerned about where we might go long-term with tr- people trying to look different, people not being happy with themselves and you know playing into that sort of culture of everybody wanting to change how they look naturally. So I try to balance that and support people looking like a healthy version of themselves. And I don't really do treatments for of people who want to change drastically change any of their natural gifts. I leave that that type of treatment to other other doctors. Nice. Thank you. This is from hmm Jill. Skin tags and seborrheic keratosis moles. Why do I have them? How to get rid of them and how do I prevent them? They are very genetic. They are very familial, meaning they run in families and we don't, we never really knew why some people would get them. It could be frictional. It could be um, hormonal, but I think recently there is a small, there is a subset of people who may develop more. It's not necessarily proven yet, but there's a theory that some people may develop more when they start to carry higher blood sugars, which means that their insulin will also be higher trying to get that blood sugar into their cells. When insulin levels running around the body are higher, we start to go toward a pre-diabetic or or a type two diabetes state. And when that's happening, we have that higher insulin level that begins to act and trigger other hormones in our body. There's insulin-like growth factor that gets triggered. And there's some theory that when all of that is happening in our bodies and we're insulin resistant and not responding well to insulin, that excess pressure for growth factors and inflammation may contribute to growing more skin tags and seborrheic keratoses. It's possible. So if you feel like you might be somebody that could be heading in a, into a pre-diabetic situation, or you wonder if you have, if your metabolism may be off, you could see your primary care doctor and just have your blood sugars and your insulin levels checked. Make sure that you're not heading in that direction. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is from Susan. How can I get rid of brown spots on my upper lip? I'm so self-conscious about them. It makes me look like I have a mustache. Eek. Brown spots on the upper lip could be at least, at least two different things. It could be lentigos, the lentigenes, which are very stubborn and hard to get rid of. They are sunspots. And when they're on the back of the hands, we used to call them liver spots. They're just from sun and the skin being exposed to sun over decades I think fading creams, bleach, bleaching creams, lasers can be potentially used, but it's important to know that those can recur and it's all, it's important to use sunscreen, like a massive constant use of very uh, robust sunscreen all the time. Once you fade them to try to reduce them returning. It's, it's not a great month to talk about it because May going into June and July is a really tough time for the pigment spots, but it's good to start protecting from the sun now, even while you research what to do, because if you protect from the sun all summer, you actually do yourself a favor come fall and winter, you're already better off in terms of getting rid of them. But a lot of that is also true for the other common type of upper lip pigment, which is melasma. Melasma is a very, another very stubborn, but m- deeper in the skin, hormonally and genetically triggered type of a pigment that can also be very responsive to the types of sunscreens. We now know we need the type of sunscreen that blocks not only the classic ultraviolet rays, ultraviolet radiation, 
but we need sunscreen that also blocks the visible rays, which are is the light you can see. If you're in a room with light on, those are visible rays. So for melasma, sunscreen has to be on basically around the clock, unless you're in a dark room to be able to have the melasma fade on its own. We didn't really realize in the past that in addition to ultraviolet radiation, which is the invisible rays from the sun, it's also the visible light and also heat. We now know that heat alone, which technically is infrared radiation, it's also invisible, but we experience it as heat triggers melasma. So staying cool, watch out if you're over a hot cooking stove or you're, you go to the sauna every day after you exercise, those things are going to actually potentially keep your melasma going. Interesting. So there's another similar question because I guess, is there a difference between age spots, brown spots, and melasma? Because this uh, question asker, Mary says, she has brownish spots on her face that are slowly expanding. Her regular doctor has examined them and says they're age spots. Is there anything I can do to at least lighten them? Lemon juice does not work. That's what they told you like in the old days to put lemon juice. Right. We tried lemon juice. It's not really that effective. Again. Um, Age spot is really a very generic term. It's hard to know what the person is exactly meaning when they say it. So traditionally, when we say age spot, we mean these lentigos, also known in the old days as liver spots, um, not because they come from problems with the liver, but because they were liver colored, that kind of brownish liver color. <clears throat> so the, the, the differentiation there is the melasma can tend to be a little more grayish brown. It can be like a little more bluish grayish brown, a little darker. The liver spot, lentigo, age spot, sun spot is a bit more of a light classic brown, like, a, like the color of a liver in a cartoon, not actually the color of a real liver, which is a bit of a different color. They're stubborn. They can be potentially faded with a physical treatment. They are a growth in the skin, these, these lentigos. It is actually cells in the skin. So they have to be um, possibly lightly frozen off to try to peel them or lasered off. And usually when that's done well, it may leave a pink spot. People don't like that either. So be ready for that. It's not necessarily easy to just erase them with no mark left over and they do tend to recur. They're famous among dermatologists for being much more stubborn than they look like they should be because some of them are so faint and just very hard to get rid of. Yeah. So it, in like many things is prevention, the cure. I mean, if people were really diligent about always using sunscreen since they were babies, would, would some of this be ameliorated? Uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to say yes. If a baby is born and is never, never goes in the sun at all. A lot of these spots and moles and lentigos never develop. And even, you know, wrinkles, wrinkles don't develop. The, the, it really does make a difference. It really is just lifelong sun exposure. You know, as a dermatologist, I am doing head to toe skin cancer screenings all day long. I do, I recommend people do them once a year. And I see constantly the difference between that sun exposed skin and the skin that is generally not everybody, but generally always, always under the underwear lifelong. And there's a big difference in the evidence of sun damage. Yeah. Well, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Next question is from Francine. What is safe to use around the eyes and the eyelids for soothing and moisturizing? I have tear duct issues. Eyes are tricky and uh, there's an overlap in eyelid, eyelash, uh, and eye skin health between dermatologists and ophthalmologists. So I like to make sure that my patients, I think I've seen a lot of what we call blepharitis, which is inflammation of the eyelid, especially the eyelid edges, the eyelash glands and the tear duct openings. We call it blepharitis. And 
I've noticed lately that people who do not, who usually try to protect their eyes by cleaning, by washing their face and cleaning around the eyes and leaving the eyes alone so they don't get soap in them, may be building up dead skin cells and oil and potentially some yeast, which is the same yeast that causes dandruff in the eyelash glands and maybe in the tear duct openings. And that can lead, in my experience, to inflammation and also to styes, blepharitis, clogged meibomian glands, which are the glands of the eyelashes, and styes. So I actually have my patients change their face washing habits and try to get brave and close their eyes and wash their eyelashes and eyelids to remove some of the, the dead cells and the oil and the and the hairs that want to fall out anyway, but may, may get stuck. So that's number one. What would be safe to use? You know, any gentle, fragrance-free moisturizer that is light, that could be used on the face, in my opinion, can also be used on the eyelids carefully. I even, I'm very, very comfortable with plain, a thin layer of plain Vaseline petroleum jelly, depending on your issue with the tear duct. I don't, I wouldn't go against what your ophthalmologist would recommend. They may feel that's too oily for you, but it's extremely gentle and protective too. So those are some thoughts. Great. Thanks. This is from Gary and he says, I think it's, I think it's a uh, male. Uh, thank you for answering my question last month. I did try the Bakuchi oil and it appears to be working. I wonder if you have used or heard of Purity Woods serums and have you seen any results with their creams? Uh, I'm so glad that Bakuchi oil is working. That's fantastic. I do, I'm not familiar with Purity Woods and I don't know about their products or ingredients. So I can't comment on that. Okay. I know that some of their products are not vegan, which is why uh, at people that are ethical vegans don't use some of their products. It's a, it's a guy that has a, a Brian Baisley a summit on aging. So um, anyway, that it'd be cool if you'd like explore different products, you know, like blind, blind, not taste tests, but you know what I mean? Like not knowing what they were in other words, you know? Right. Maybe one day I'll, I'll organize myself a little, a little trial experiment and give results. But for now I'm, I'm comfortable not trying because the truth is I will never really know how these products are formulated. So it's really hard for me to do anything other than try it for a few days and say, Oh, I think it's, you know, doesn't irritate my skin. Just like you guys, I, the, tr it's very hard for me to deliver truth on product lines without getting all of their background secret scientific research, which when I have it, it really helps me know more about what's going on. Nice. Thanks. Uh, it's so nice that so many men uh, write in. This is from Benito and he thanks us for answering the questions last time. Guys, you can get an answer just by sending us an email. I know you're hanging out in the chat and it's just not possible to get them from the chat when there's a popular doctor on. And he said, do you know of any new advancements in hair growth or hair restoration? I'm halfway through my thirties and losing hair from both the front and the back of my head. I'm hoping that something is invented soon because I want to get to my hundreds rocking a beard and long flowing hair like I'm in my early 20s. Well, I think that was our first question today about hair loss. Hair loss is the holy grail of dermatology. If we can invent something that prevents people from losing hair or regrows the hair when they've actually lost it, and the, and the other holy grail will be stopping people from turning gray. Those are, those are two big, you know, huge areas of research. I can promise you there's, you know, Rogaine, there is Propecia, which is the pill. There are, and that's the generic of that is finasteride. There's another pill called dutasteride and Rogaine is topical minoxidil, but now some doctors are starting to prescribe the pill oral minoxidil, not me. So if you're watching this, um, I won't be able to prescribe it for you, but some dermatologists are doing it and even probably some primary care doctors. Minoxidil is originally a blood pressure medication, a pill. And they, you know, like, like happens with a lot of other tr cosmetic treatments we have, we accidentally found out it was doing something beneficial cosmetically when it was being used for medical reasons. 
when people were taking it for blood pressure in the old days, they were growing more hair. So it became then, you know, swiped by the companies to develop hair growth, hair growth treatments. Similarly, um, when Botox was being used for mus- eye muscle spasming, they saw that the people who were getting the treatments had fewer wrinkles around their eyes. And that's how Botox became first known as a cosmetic anti-wrinkle treatment. And other, other similar discoveries have been made. So th- I don't know of a brand, brand new magical treatment for hair right now, but there are companies out there starting to mix different known hair loss treatments into serums that are compounded individual, you know, that are specially compounded. So you can use one product and give it a try. It's worth seeing your dermatologist to get a more comprehensive evaluation because hair loss is tricky. It's in, you know, almost inexorable. It's, it's persistent. And the sooner you get a treatment that's really holding your hair, the better, because once it's gone, it doesn't really grow back a lot. Yeah. A lot of people struggle with that. This is a question from Jean. I'm looking for a topical to reduce the dryness of my 80 year old skin that is affordable, has minimal unpronounceable, possibly toxic additives, and is unlikely to clog my drains when I bathe. What is your opinion of cold press safflower oil, or do you have any other suggestions? Um, You know, anything that's an oil is not unlikely to clog a drain, first of all. So I can't really promise you that something that will really hydrate your skin will not risk clogging a drain, but oils are fine. Uh, I, you know, there's a, I will name a commercial over the counter moisturizer called CeraVe, which I, I just name because I've seen a diagram of all of the different ingredients that go into most of the commercial plain drugstore traditional moisturizers and CeraVe cream had the most hydrating ingredients in terms of what doesn't contain toxic um, additives. I don't really know, but it's far, you know, from my point of view, these very commercial, well-tested products aren't necess- don't necessarily contain toxins that intact healthy humans have to worry about. So, uh, you know, in terms of endocrine disruptors and things like that, if you stay away from fragrances and go for very basic, plain emollient creams, I'm not that worried about toxins. Okay. We have something in the chat. Karen is recommending something for her eye. It's called We Love Eyes. It was recommended by an ophthalmologist. So maybe somebody wants to look into that, you know, that's interesting. Okay. Next question is from Susan. My thumb and index finger will crack at the corner of the nails. It's very painful and no sooner do they heal that they crack again. I use a lot of lotion and massage it into the fingers at the nail, but it doesn't seem to help. And this happens all year round. I assume that there is a question there of what to do. So oh, yeah. you know, I think she, she just wanted you to know. No, I was just kidding. Yeah, I'm sure she wants this, to. This is... Um, not that easy for me to completely solve via the internet without looking at it. But given the fact that it's thumb and index finger, it does make me wonder, first of all, is there something that Karen is touching that she may be allergic to or sensitive to people who touch a lot of paper all day long, uh, you know, at the office, they can actually get dried out on their fingertips from the paper, constant paper contact or the chemicals in the paper. There's bleach, there's there's other chemicals in paper that can really be irritating to skin. Cleaning dishes, you know, holding the dishes in one hand and they that hand doesn't really get that wet, but the other hand has the sponge or goes into the water and washes the dish and that hand gets a lot more eczema. This kind of fingertip cracking is just a severe form of eczema in terms of what we call dishydrotic eczema, which means there's probably water damage and soap damage 
that is constantly occurring and continually drying out inside that crack where it start trying to heal up from the inside. <clears throat> Excuse me. So prevention and protection are it's there's just no way around it. There's no medication that will really solve it. And when you say lotion, lotions are technically formulated differently from creams and which are formulated differently from ointments. A lotion has more water and a lotion that absorbs in and doesn't feel greasy and is very comfortable is actually not greasy enough to protect, recreate the barrier that's lost and help the skin to heal itself from the inside. So the thicker and greasier the cream is, the more protective it is and the more ability, the better ability it has to heal hands and fingers. That's why hand creams that are really formulated for hands do tend to be a little thick and greasy. It's intentional and it really won't work without it. So try to move toward a cream and especially a hand cream. The best ones are about halfway between Vaseline and a white cream. They rub in very well and they turn invisible and they don't look shiny but they're really silky and greasy and they stay in place. That should be on your skin 24 hours a day, reapplied probably every 20 to 30 minutes. And then your hands should never go into water or soap without a big kitchen glove on. And if you're touching a lot of paper, you might actually have to put little finger protectors on you if you can't change that job. Mm, good to know. Thanks. Here's another fingernail question, but it's different. From Donna, what causes fingernails and toenails to develop ridges and lines that go from the cuticle to the end of the nail? Four of my fingernails and three of my toenails have these vertical ridges for over 15 years, but the rest are smooth. Most Google sources say signs of aging, but I feel like it must indicate a deficiency or overexposure to something because my 99-year-old grandmother's nails are all smooth. It's true that this is something that does happen over time and with age. And I don't know why you've had three nails look like that for 15 years. I don't know if I'll be able to figure it out there. It, it may be a genetic anomaly. It may be that those, the, the root of those nails got damaged long ago, maybe with a manicure or maybe with some, uh, cleaning trauma and the seal between the cuticle and the matrix root of the nail never really fully repaired. It tends to be a sign that the cuticle is not sealed and is allowing that nail to be dried out as it's growing. It, that's what those longitudinal ridges tend to be a sign of. And that's why as we get older, the nail, the nail matrix and root of the nail isn't as hydrated and is not able to hold as much hydration as it used to. Just like our hair gets more dried out and doesn't grow as well, our nails get more dried out and don't grow as well. So why there are just a few nails, I'm not totally sure, but check your cuticles, make sure they're sealed, hydrated, and healthy. When you get manicures, do not let the manicurist cut the cuticle skin off. And if she, she or he is going to push them back with an orange wood stick gently, it cannot hurt at all. It, it If it hurts or pinches, that's actually too severe and is causing disruption to the seal and can cause trouble with the nail later. Thanks. This is from Stephanie. She asks about whiteheads to the left and right of her nose. She thinks she may have gotten them as a reaction to the adhesive on COVID masks that adhered to the face. The little cluster to the left of my nose seems to have diminished, but not completely disappeared on their own. However, there is one stubborn one to the right of my nose. Is there a home remedy I can use to get rid of this whitehead? I had no surgery for a deviated septum years ago, and that remains sensitive. If I were to try to pop it, for example, using two Q-tips, I've read about home remedies, including apple cider vinegar, but I'm not sure if any of them work. Shouldn't she see a doctor about this? Thank you for answering for me. Yeah, I mean, um, it just sounds like, I mean, what, you know, that I, even if you could do it at home, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't take a chance, especially with my face. Well, you know, the term whitehead uh, is one of those also sort of generic terms of people use it to mean a lot of different things. It mean, you know, people use it to mean any bump with a white tip. 
But the old fashioned classic term whitehead originally meant a pustule, which is a, one of the four or five types of pimples that we get in acne. A pustule is a little inflammatory red bump with a white tip that you could easily scratch off. I don't want you to do it because it could create infection or scarring, but a pimp, a little acne pimple with a white tip is the old, the old fashioned whitehead. Um, or, or it was also used, um, to describe comedones, which are closed or open. If they're open, they call them blackheads. And if they're closed, they call them whiteheads. And those look like you could gently squeeze them and get the stuff out. Again, don't do it because it can actually damage your pore opening and create scarring. But, th but I have a feeling that this question is about a more stubborn type of a white bump that might be something called a milium cyst or a mi when there are a lot of them, we call them milia. That really cannot be removed at home. And I don't think apple cider vinegar would touch it. All it would do would be to burn your face. Um, those milia are tiny cysts that need surgical intervention if they don't eventually work themselves out on their own. So I do uh, remove milia in the office, but I use a needle or a scalpel to do it and it can leave a scar. So I would not recommend doing it at home. It's basically a miniature surgery. Now, let me just say that a lot of estheticians may attack them during facials legally, at least in my state, they're not legally allowed to be doing that. They're allowed to gently treat anything that's on the surface of the skin, but they're not technically supposed to do inter invasive surgical procedures. So I can't say go get a facial and let them do it because they're not supposed to be doing it. Mm, thanks. All right. Here is a question from, I don't know, uh, Michelle. I was told I have actinic keratosis. Maybe you could say what that is on the bridge of my nose and the dermatologist wanted to freeze it. I was not sure what other options are available and if this is the best method or what else can be done. If nothing is done, what can it lead to? Actinic keratosis is a keratosis, which is an, a, a, an osis of the keratinocyte, which means like a growth of the keratinocyte. Actinic means it has come from sun damage, as opposed to seborrheic keratosis, which is, they call it seborrheic. It's like related to seborrheic dermatitis, which is like a dandruff. So seborrhea means sort of greasy. Seborrheic keratosis and seborrheic keratoses are benign and harmless. Actinic keratosis and actinic keratoses are precancerous growths. Now, we don't exactly know that they will guarantee definitely turn into skin cancer it, during your lifetime. We don't know if they do, how quickly it happens. We just don't know. So we have taken on the habit of treating them to get rid of them before they do turn into skin cancer. So that is, if it's a true actinic keratosis, think of it as a precancerous growth and the goal will be to destroy the cells that are precancerous. That means their DNA is damaged and allow your skin to grow back in that area healthy and smooth. Freezing the cells is just one medical way of destroying the cells. It's an easy way for you because the doctor does it in the office, the dermatologist does it, and then you go home and it will take care of itself. You don't have to do anything. You do need to go back and get the spot check to make sure it's gone. Because if an actinic keratosis is stubborn and does not completely resolve with treatment, it may need a biopsy to find out whether there's already a little skin cancer there. So don't walk away from it and think that it will never turn into something bad. Freezing is just physical destruction of the cells. Some doctors may laser it. I promise you that doesn't really make a big difference. Um, in the outcome, as long as the cells are destroyed, freezing is, is an old fashioned, classic, legitimate way to do it. Uh, and it's probably also cheaper for you. There are creams. There is, there's chemotherapy medicine that we use internally when people have in, invasive and internal cancers. 
and it's called fluoro 5 fluorouracil it's a real anti metabolite they used to call it uh, it really affects the how the dna works in your cells and it goes to find and destroy cells that are dividing more rapidly than normal that's what cancer is so this 5 fluorouracil has a few brand names we call it also 5fu and um, I won't comment on that, but we we use it to attack pre-cancer, sometimes cancer, skin cancers that are very thin in people who cannot tolerate surgery. And sometimes we use it for other types of infected cells like warts. That's a prescription and it does require multiple weeks of you putting it on yourself at home and then coming back to the dermatologist and being checked. So it's not necessarily a better idea than the freezing. There's another cream called Imiquimod, which it is also prescription and does require also multiple weeks of treatment at home by you and following up with the dermatologist anyway. Um, that may be another option. That one helps your own immune system wake up to the knowledge that there's a damaged cell and helps your rev up your own immune system to fight it off. These creams if you have a lot of precancerous cells, they can really rev up your immune system. And for some people give you a little bit of an almost flu-like feeling because your immune system starts going and you feel like you have a, a cold or the flu. If it's just a small spot, it's probably very easy to tolerate. It would be a lot to go through doing your whole face at once because you can get scabby and inflamed and, and not feel well. So Freezing is not a bad idea. It, it really takes it out of your hands, but as long as you promise to follow up, but everything has its pros and cons. Those are just three of the most common ways we address them. So when you say freezing, is that that little thing that sits on the counter when you go to the dermatologist? It's usually like it's a little canister and then they, they put it on and it, it kind of hurts, but not that bad. A lot of people have the spray canister. Yeah, we call it, we, I forgot what the name of that, but little spray canister with a, with a controlled tip that helps us just pinpoint a little spot treatment. We really are giving you medical frostbite. It really is true frostbite. Like if you were lost in the tundra, um, but we're just putting it on the spot that we want to kill. When you get frostbite out in the tundra, you lose your fingers because they, they get frozen and they die. But we just want to freeze little cells that we don't want there. So they will die. They will fall off and then you will heal with healthy skin. Some doctors use a little styrofoam cup or a little cup with a Q-tip and do the same thing. So I had an interesting experience with that is he, it went too deep and it created a hole in my face and he actually fixed it with some technique called subcision that he had to do for a long time, but it, it, it thank God it worked because I had a hole in my face and it wasn't nice. It's, you know, it's why I say try to see a board certified dermatologist because these tools our weapons and they seem innocent, but you know, most of the things we do could cause damage if, if done wrong, you know, a little biopsy could, could go wrong, a, a, a freezing. Um, it's hard to say because we use that same freezing method to treat cancers, real developed skin cancers in people who can't tolerate surgery. And we call it cryo surgery. And those are very aggressive freezings and they do go very deep and they make very deep wounds because we're trying to get under the skin and kill all the cells that are deep in there that we can't see. So we don't mess around and it hurts yeah. um, the way that frostbite would hurt, but eventually that skin will heal. And if it leaves a little bit of a scar, hopefully the doctor can do a little subcision, do a little microneedling, do a little filler, a little laser. Uh, injecting. Now we know injecting those depressed scars just with plain saline salt water does an amazing amount to help those get better too. It just stimulates the collagen in the area to fill back in. So there, these are medical treatments and we want to make sure all the bad cells are gone. We try to make the cosmetic result as good as we can. I mean, it's amazing how many conditions you just know it that like just off the top of your head, you must have, had, that's, that's amazing to me. Like it, you just, nothing seems to throw you, you know, do you remember the episode of Seinfeld where he was dating a dermatologist? 
you know, believe it or not, I've never seen the episode, but you better believe I've heard all about oh, it. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> I hope, I hope I mean, I'll see if I can find it. You've got to watch it. It's so funny. Okay. This is a question. Uh, you know, it's interesting because this is about an infant and as a dermatologist, you could actually see anybody any age. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to go into dermatology was because I really did love my pediatrics rotations. I, I loved my I almost went into adolescent medicine because I love teenagers and I loved my OBGYN rotations, my surgery rotations. I really loved medical school. And although people sometimes think of dermatology as just a superficial field, you know, literally and figuratively, I, I loved dermatology when I really got a chance to do a rotation and dig in because my teachers, my fellow residents who were a little bit ahead of me were so brilliant and I really saw how dermatology, you know, if you understand skin and skin health and how to look at people, you can tell what's happening inside with their health in so many cases. In When I was in medical school, I had a patient with a rash and it turned out that that rash was a sign that she had not only a GI cancer, but she had a liver cancer, which are the most common types of cancer when you have that exact rash. So dermat and, you know, nail health, you look at nails, you can tell about kidney health. We look at the skin, we can tell about liver health. We can talk about the health of the immune system. We can not, not me, honestly, it's not me, but some of the most brilliant dermatologists that I do know who have been some of my teachers are really like internal medicine physicians who also really understand the skin. So it, it's, it's a miracle to see these mysteries being unraveled when somebody is just looking at a person and can tell the whole story of what's happening on the inside. Yeah, that's neat. So this is for an infant. Uh, well, the infant didn't write somebody else wrote on their behalf and wants to remain anonymous. And she says her grandson was born in September of 20. 22 and was diagnosed in January of 2023 with severe cradle cap and eczema on the rest of his body. There's no family history of eczema. The cradle cap is now gone with the help of happy cappy body wash and cream. Other creams recommended by the dermatologist didn't help much, Sarah V. Avino, but he still has eczema. The mom eats the standard American diet and he's being breastfed now, being supplemented with formula made of dairy. What is the root cause? Is it dairy processed food through breast milk and now formula? And how can we help the infant get rid of the eczema? Hmm. I am not a pediatric dermatologist. And so I do see young kids and, and teenagers, but I really don't take care of babies. I had a little bit of pediatric training in my residency, but um, for severe pediatric and infant eczema, I think it's important to see a pediatric dermatologist. We used to think that food allergies caused eczema, but now it may actually be possible that babies with eczema have that disrupted skin barrier. And when foods are, when foods touch that skin, either on the face or the hands, um, it may introduce food allergens to the body in an unusual way, not through the mouth that may confuse the body and create a food allergy. So it is important to be able to heal up that eczema and a, a baby eczema is complicated. I'll tell you that one of the most important things to understand is that babies um, should not be overbathed or overwashed and the treatment of the skin should be very gentle. And there was a study that showed that babies who were completely slathered in plain Vaseline petroleum jelly for the first six months of their lives did reduce their later experience with eczema and also reduced a, allergic, um, sort of having an allergic type of a, of a health situation later on. So that barrier protection, complete sealing up that, that dry inflamed skin, um, even with plain Vaseline all the time, like way more than you would think would be normal. Just keeping them sealed up it has has really helped to heal that damaged barrier from the inside out. In terms of other interventions, it's it's a little complicated for me to say in this situation, but see if you can find a 
pediatric dermatologist because they really do have special training with this exact type of situation. Nice. I can't believe how many questions you answered in an hour. Thank you so much. I mean, if you have time for one more, I'll ask, but you know, there, we have so many, so it's really up to you. Well, why don't we hang on to it for next time and, and keep everybody on the edge of their seat waiting to see what's going to come up next. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Krant. This was really, I mean, I learned so much. It's just so interesting. Do you, but I just, just really quickly though, what she said, I know you're not a pediatric dermatologist, but in general, can what a mother eats affect the child's skin, like through the breast milk? I think that that is possible, but it's also less than we used to think. So it's, it's true for certain foods. And I think if, if it's possible to transmit sort of allergic type reactions, but I, I have to say, don't know enough about it to give clear guidelines. Great. Well, thanks. And thanks for saying you don't know when you don't know. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. We have an incredible bonus show today. It's 7 p.m. Pacific time with none other than Dr. Caldwell B. Esselson Jr., the first 500 people that join get to be on the Zoom and he can see you and you can see him. That information was sent out on an email on Tuesday. So if you're not on my mailing list, you're going to miss out. So get on ChefAJ.com. Take care, everybody. Thanks again, Dr. Krant. Thank you for having me. See everybody.